I'm Dr. Herbert Bailey, and this is my wife, Dr. Marsha Bailey. I'm known to challenge you in your faith, and she's known to encourage you to never give up. But ultimately, we're here to give you practical steps to get positive results in your life. Heading in the right direction. 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 Today's message is Learning to Be Content by Dr. Herbert Bailey. Philippians, the fourth chapter, starting a new series tonight. Philippians, the fourth chapter, starting at verse 10. It says, but I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me has flourished again. By the way, this is, let me just set the, this is Paul writing to his, um, uh, his, I'm not going to say favorite church, but his church that he was most appreciative of. Because they didn't have a whole lot of issues, and they were a church that was really financially um, very supportive of his ministry. And this is his basically a thank you letter to his partners at Philippi. So he says, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care of me. He's talking of their financial support again, has flourished again. He said, wherein you were also careful. Meaning he said, I know that you did care, but you lacked opportunity. He lacked opportunity. And one of the reasons why he lacked opportunity because one time he, he wouldn't let him give to him anymore. Verse 11, he said, not that I speak in respect of want. He said, I'm not saying this because I'm trying to get something from you. I'm not saying it because I speak to, in respect of want. Come on, re read, read the next part with me. For I have learned, come on, read it with me. For I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. Okay? Therewith to be content. And then he goes on to say, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. And it's in this context that he writes this famous, most quoted verse of Philippians 4.13 that we apply to anything that we say, you know, when I want to start a business, when I want to succeed at school, when something seems too hard, we, we quote this scripture. But he was saying this in, with respect to financial circumstances. And he says this, Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. And so I'm starting a new series and I'll be teaching it for the next few weeks. And it is entitled, Learning to Be Content. Learning to be content. Okay? Now, a couple of things I want to point out quickly here. He says, uh, uh, he's really thanking them. He says, I rejoice that you're giving them again, you're supporting my ministry again. He says, and, and he knows how people are. When you start saying anything about offering on any level, they think you're trying to get something from them. So he said, I'm not saying this because I'm trying to get anything from you. Uh, he basically says, because I've learned to make it, whether you give to me or not. <laughs> That's basically what he's saying. He said, I've learned I'm going to be all right. God takes care of me. He said, I have learned that God is my source. He said, I, so I'm not saying this because I need anything. And, but, but he said, I have learned. Learn meant he, that's not where he started off. Learn when it's not the most natural thing. Amen. Certain things you don't have to learn, okay? You know, you don't really have to learn how to eat. Eating comes very natural to most of us, amen? You don't have to learn to, you don't have to, learn to, to drink, you know? Uh, a child does not have to learn how to nurse. I mean, as soon as a child's born, you can place them at their, at, at their mother's breast and they'll, and they'll nurse, okay? You, you got to learn of, to drive a car. You have to learn to do arithmetic, Okay, so meaning it's not something not where you start, but you'll end up there through learning. And he said, I've learned in whatever state 
I am therewith to be content. He said, I've learned how to be content, meaning I wasn't always content, and I used to get moved by my circumstances, but I've learned to be content, which means we can learn to be content. Amen. Amen. Everyone say, I will learn to be content. And then he goes on to say, I'm jumping w- w- way ahead of w- what, I, what I'll get to in, in a few weeks because it's going to take a few weeks before I get to you, tell you finally how to learn. We're going to really look at this content, contentment and discontentment. What, what's the root of this? He said, I know. He said, I've learned. Now I know. I've learned. Now I know. You can't know something until you first learn it. Okay? How many of y'all know, know what two plus two is? Oh, Jesus, Lord, help me. I thought I had Lisa. I thought I had Lisa Elementary ele- Educated Church. How many of y'all know what two plus two is? What's two plus two? Quick. Mm, some of y'all. F- <laughs> I, mean, I know it's been a long time since you had to add two plus two. Okay, but you learn that. You learn that, and you know, I. I mean, I. I went to. You know, I know they learn all kind of ways now. But I went to Catholic school, and, and we used to. The nun used to hit the ruler. Two plus two, two times two is four. Two times four is eight, you know, and like that. And we had to say it, on, say it on beat. And so you learn through experience. You learn through repetition. You learn through going through things more than once. And Paul said, I learned, and now I know. He said, I've gotten to the place now that I don't get concerned about what things look like. I've gotten to the place now. He said, I know now. I didn't just learn. He said, I've I've mastered this thing. (laughs) And you're going, if you're going to be a person of faith and walk with God, you're going to have to master not being moved by your circumstances. You've got to start, first you learn it. And then you get to the place that you're not moved every time something doesn't look like what you want it to look like and, and doesn't look like it's turning out the way you want it to, to turn out. He says, now I know how to abound. I know how to make it when I'm balling, and I know how to make it when the ball deflated. <laughs> Amen. He said, I'm, I'm all right. I've learned I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need, both to have an abundance. And he, and you know what he said? He said, you will never know by looking at me what I'm going through. Come on now. My mother used to say to me things, you know, she, my mother didn't really teach me how, after she died other than the fact that she didn't have a will, okay, she died intestate. Okay, and if you die without a will, you die intestate, okay? And um, other, other than that, my mother, you know, I had to wake up in the middle of, middle of the night to go to the bathroom about 2 o'clock in the morning or something, and she'd be sitting at the, she'd be sitting at the table doing the bills and, and budgeting and all that. Ne- ne- never taught me how to do any of that stuff, and so, you know, I just did like most people did, you know, learn by trial and error. And she used to just say stuff to me like, you know, money just burn a hole in your pocket. You spend it just as quick as you get it. A fool and his money soon part, you know, and, but, but, but she didn't teach me, okay? And so if you don't know, you're going to just do what seems natural to you. Paul said, but I've learned. And okay, and there's this point I'll make. And, then, and, 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 and she's always say, it's obvious when you get money because you get happy because I'm happy. <laughs> yeah, you all get happy when you got money. Oh, but you get irritable when you don't have money. Mm-hmm. Clap along if you feel like it. You happy, glory to God, payday. And then let something happen. Leave me alone, I'm going through. What's wrong? Nothing. What's, something's wrong. Nothing, if there was something wrong, I'll let you know something wrong. Well, why are you raising my voice? I'm not raising my voice. Okay? And we get stressed. 
regarding money and what things look like. Paul said, I've, I've been instructed through the experiences I've gone through, both to be full and to be abound. He said, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. He said, I found out when I'm balling or when the ball's deflated, as I said earlier, that God's my source. I've, I found out that everything don't turn out what it looked like. Just because it looked like it's not going to work out doesn't mean it's not going to work out. I've learned not to be moved by my circumstances. I've learned to be content. So my objective is that we would learn to be content. Go to 1 Timothy 6, chapter, verse 6 through 8. Okay. I don't have time to set all this up, but in the prior scripture, Paul's writing to his young son in the gospel, who's a young pastor of one of the churches that he's established. And he's, you know, it's in this chapter that he tells them later, tell the rich how, how they're supposed to act regarding their wealth, be ready to give and distribute and all that. And he says, and he tells them, he says, beware because there are some people who are coming into the church and entering the church. Watch this. And some of, and, and some of the circles I've been in, some of us, we could be accused of this. And Paul said, because in pride, verse of pride, verse 6, he says, some of them are going to be teaching that gain is godliness. He said, some people will teach that, in other words, that you look more godly based upon more stuff you got. That some type of way, that's a measure of your spirituality. You having a new car, you having nice houses, you have a nice stuff, a nice jewelry. That's some type of way. That's the measure of your spirituality. We know that ain't the measure of your spirituality. I mean, pimps got stuff. <laughs> Drug dealers got stuff. Come on now. People who are totally non-conscious of God got stuff. So we know stuff cannot be a measure of your spirituality. Paul said, so don't start thinking that gain is godliness. He said, contrary. He said, flip that thing around, 1 Timothy 6 and 6. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Here's a formula for gain, the formula for increase. Godliness plus contentment will bring increase. Godliness plus, con plus contentment will bring, will bring increase. Matthew 6, 33, that's, that's what he's telling us the same thing. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Be godly in, in his estimation. Seek ye first. And, and all these things will be added. Seek ye first kingdom of God. And, right, and all these what things shall be added to you. Godliness plus contentment is going to cause things to be added to you. But just because you get things added to you, it does not mean you're godly, and it surely doesn't lead to contentment. He says, come on. He said, let, let, let's get the right perspective about stuff and money and wealth. Verse 7, he said, come on, remember, for we brought nothing in the, into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us therewith be content. Verse 7, we brought nothing into the world, and certainly we can take nothing out. I told you about the man who was always, he always heard the preacher saying this. He brought nothing into the world, and he was a multimillionaire, so he made his wife promise. He said, when I die, that preacher always saying, you can't take it with you. I want all my money in the casket with me. See, when I die, put it all in there. She said, oh, he said, yeah, he said, this. He said, I want all my money in the casket. And he always do tell all his friends and all, you know, other couples when they were together. I told my wife, when I die, when y'all make sure you take all my money and put in that cast. So he died. And, uh, they, you know, they're sitting there at the funeral. And then one, one of the girlfriends said to her, girl, did you, you put that money in the cask? She said, yeah. You, you a fool. He, just because you didn't have to do that. Just because he said put all that money in the cask. She said, I gave him a check. And if he can cash it, more power to him. <laughs> we brought nothing into this world. And it's certain we can carry nothing out. So verse 8, he says, he says, so at the end of the day, y'all, he said, having food and raiment, let us be what? Content. Now, I'm going to go on as I explain, but let me just, before y'all get up and want to leave now, because I think I'm going from, now, now he's preaching poverty. He used to preach spots, but now he's preaching poverty. What, what's wrong with him? Okay? Content here, it does not mean that you won't accept anymore. You're not believing God to do anymore. But what he's saying is, like Paul said, it, you're not moved in the interim. I still got peace. I still got joy. 
I know it's just a matter of time. I, I know things are getting better. I know God's working in my life. I, I, I know that favor is surrounding me. I know that there are invisible things that's going to show up in the visible. I know he's already prepared everything I need so I can be all right in the interim because this is just a temporary situation. I've learned to be content. The amplifier of those verses, 1 Timothy 6 to 8, uh, 6, 6 to 8, he says, and it is indeed a source of immense profit for godliness accompanied with contentment, that contentment which is a sense of inward sufficiency, inward sufficiency, which one of the definitions of, of contentment. Inward sufficiency is great and abundant gain. For we brought nothing to the world, and obviously we cannot take anything out of it. For if we have food and clothing, with these we shall be content. He says satisfied. Now that word content, it comes from a Greek word, that is uh, uh, our case, our tau case, spelled A U T A R K E S, and it means self complacent. Self complacent. It means self sufficient. It means without need for external things to feel good or be happy. Without need for external things to feel good. Or be happy. So when Paul says, I've learned to be content in whatever state I'm in, he said, I've learned that I don't need external things to, in order for me to be happy. Okay? It means a state of inward peace. Everybody say inward peace. Okay? Contentment, and content means it's a place of not being moved by external circumstances and external situations either good or bad, but you got to learn that, okay? Now, what are, what are characteristics of discontentment? I probably won't get to, based upon me teaching this at noon today, noon session, I probably won't get any further than this one. What's characteristics of discontentment? Because the opposite of being content would be discontent. So, watch this. So, if you're discontent, it means that you have no self-complacency, that you have no sufficiency inside of you other than you get all your all feelings of value, your feelings of security, your feelings of wealth, your feelings of peace. It all has to be based upon external stuff. If you're discontent, then you have a need for external things to feel good and to be happy. If you're discontent, you don't have any state of inward peace. If you're discontent, you're at a place that you will move constantly on a roller coaster based upon how the economy is doing, how, how much money you got in your pocket on a given day, what things look like, what, how much money look like you're going to make this year. You're always in this state of inner turmoil because you're discontent. Now, let me back up and, and lay this as a foundation as I did in noon session today. I've been in church all my life, probably like my grandchildren you know, uh, they, they've been coming to church, to, I mean, since, you know, all, all in those church, right? And so, you know, at some point you, when, you, when you've been born and raised in church, you come to church, and then at some point you realize where you are, this is church. Yeah. I mean, because you just, this is where you come all the time, you know what I'm saying? And so, I've been in church all my life. I told you I joined the church when I was 10. I wasn't trying to join the church. I was just trying to become a choir member. I was just trying to join junior choir. That's all. I just, Mom, I want to sing. I just, just want to sing. That's all. And next thing I know, because I wanted to sing, they, 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 they told me you had to go in front of church. And I walked up there 10 years old in front of everybody. And then y'all know in, in Baptist church, you stand up there and tell me whether you, you come by letter <laughs> or Christian experience. I'm like, I ain't coming for nothing but Letter? What letter? A, B, C, D? What, what letter you want? E, F, G, H, I. I didn't know nothing about all that stuff. Then they took me in a room. I don't remember what happened in the room. All I know, two weeks later, they wrapped me in a sheet and tried to drown me. I got to go through all this just to sing. Okay. But I've been in church all my life. Now, the kind of church that we are where we teach you about faith and teach you that God's concerned about your, your financial status and your social mobility and you're getting your needs met. And all. We, I, I didn't come from that. Didn't know anything about that. As a matter of fact, when I, start, when I got turned on to this stuff and I started reading Brother Hagin's book and I was still teaching our Bible study, Mother Bailey said to me, don't you get caught away with that stuff. She said, now you're reading all these books now. Don't you get caught up. 
with all this stuff, you know. And uh, some things we used to say that we didn't know what was wrong. They just say, they say, you know, they, they off. You don't know what they was off of or what, what was on was, but anybody teach anything you hadn't heard before, it was off. We didn't care if you showed us in the Bible. That ain't what we heard. <laughs> you off. Okay? And so, and, but, but I do remember, I, I, I do remember people being happy. I do remember that my grandmother served as the primary Sunday school teacher for 60 years. Er Sunday. Er Sunday. Not just every Sunday, er Sunday. Okay? Except for maybe two Sundays a year, and that was when the church went, uh, one of them, they went one week and they went to Atlantic City to gamble. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's the truth. The other one used to take a trip on Labor Day to Niagara Falls, okay? Other than that, and, and watch this, y'all. Don't, I don't, don't recall people saying, I'm not coming to church because I'm, I'm going through something right now. We came to church. We jumped. We shouted. We, was, we, we really wasn't expecting much here on earth anyway. Brother and Sister Jacobs, am I right? We, we weren't expecting nothing here on earth. We would just shout that. Man, one day I'm going where Jesus is. I'm saved. I'm sanctified. Filled with the Holy Ghost. And that with a mighty burning fire. I got a mind to run on and see what they ain't going to be. Pray my strength in the Lord that I'll be the son that he's calling for in these last and evil days. We didn't, we didn't pray. We didn't hear nobody talking about, you know, uh, uh, we, uh, uh, we, we weren't praying about promotions on the job. We wasn't praying. We, we, wasn't, we, wasn't, we, wasn't, we wasn't talking about the house over there uh, in the suburb over there. We came to church. We were jumping. We were shouting because we're going to be where Jesus is. T- watch this. Tears were running down our faith because we're saved. Saved by his power divine, saved through new life sublime. Life now is sweet and my joy is complete because I'm saved, saved, saved. Man, we were just glad to be saved. And now we save, but we're unhappy because we didn't get the car we wanted. We save and we can't, I can't come to church because I'm going through something right now because I was really believing God for this and it, it just didn't happen. Didn't happen. I was, you know, I just, it, it just, I was really expecting this thing to manifest by now. I really was, I really thought this would, you know, with all, all my giving and all my living, I gave up the happy hour, put Fu Quan out, blocked the call, don't make booty calls no more. Surely by now, I should have my Mercedes. And if it don't happen in time, we ready to go find almost another God. Because our faith has brought us to a place of discontentment. Is that really what our faith is for? Now that we know to believe God for more, now we're discontent. Are you content with where you are in life? Or do you find yourself being dissatisfied with your circumstances? Being content does not mean that you settle for less, but you learn to appreciate and not be anxious in your current state. Dr. Herbert Bailey helps to identify the root causes of discontentment so that you can learn to enjoy your life. Order these resources today for your love gift of $30 or more. Just call 1-877-798-LIFE or go online to rightdirection.info. Ask for Learning to Be Content. us to win. I've been created with the attributes of God. I've been created with the DNA of God. 
God created you to dominate. God created you to win, and then he blessed you and enabled you to do what he created you to do. What the enemy wants me to believe is my reality. It's not my reality. Hallelujah. Can I tell you something? This thing that you're walking through right now is not the final chapter of your life. But Joshua spake for his whole household. He said, for as for me and my house, we are gonna serve the Lord. Because I'm here to tell you that when men connect, they will not only have enough for the rest, they will not only have enough for women and children, but they will leave a legacy and a multiplication for the children that come after them. And what was just enough for him, he'll put it in the hands of somebody else. It'll multiply and become more than enough. Because sometimes God just needs one person to say, I still believe God. I don't care what it looked like. I don't care how long we've been in this situation. I don't care where we come from. I believe God. And if God, sometimes God just needs one believer in the house. Can somebody shout, I believe God. Man, God wants you to stand up. Right Direction Church International Men's Conference 2015, June 19th and 20th. I am man. Next time on Daily Direction. You got to learn to be secure to know you are who you are. God's given you what he's given you. And otherwise, you're always, there's always going to be somebody you, you're always going to be insecure about. And that's what happened with Saul. And he let this come out of his mouth. And he said, what can he have more but the kingdom? That was his fear talking out of discontentment and insecurity. If you are in our area, come join us at one of our three locations. In Columbia, South Carolina, Sunday morning worship is at 7.30 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. Wednesday Bible study is at 12 noon and 7 p.m. Friday women's Bible study is at 12 noon. Our worship center is located at 3506 Broad River Road in Columbia. In Orangeburg, South Carolina, join us with campus pastors Trey and Katie Brave for Sunday morning worship at 10.30 a.m. and Tuesday evening Bible study at 7 p.m. We're located at 990 Willington Drive in Orangeburg. In Florence, South Carolina, join us with campus pastors Dwayne and Denise White for Sunday morning worship at 10.30 a.m. and Tuesday evening Bible study at 7 p.m. We're located at 1507 King Avenue in Florence. Please email your testimonies to praise report at rightdirection.info or letters can be mailed to P.O. Box 21672, Columbia, South Carolina 29221. Please consider partnering with us or send a one-time financial gift. For more information, visit our website at rightdirection.info or call us toll free at 877-798-5433. Right Direction Ministries, empowering people and changing generations.